Thank you. What are your two cents on aesthetic versus function? Hmm. Uh, so internally, we always have this uh, this conversation of user experience versus sort of beautiful aesthetic. And I think if you have, if there's a battle and like guns to your head and you have to pick one of those, user experience should win. Uh, some of the world's most useful websites are the ugliest and crappiest, um, but they're very useful. So Craigslist, for example, is the, the example everyone uses. It looks like garbage, but it's, it, it works and it's, it's useful other than if you're looking for professional journalists, um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's hard to, uh, that's why contentment exists. But in terms of, you know, you need a lawnmower or whatever, Craigslist is the easiest place to go. The user experience is great and the website looks like garbage. Um, and I think also you know, one of my favorite uh, websites design-wise, I actually, I was at a, a class recently with a designer named Edward Tufte who sort of pioneered uh, the field of data visualization uh, and, uh, and I agreed with him when he said that the New York Times.com is one of the best designed websites on the internet. And it's not because it's super clean. It's not because it has white space, but it's because it has everything you could possibly look for on the homepage. The navigation on the side is like, there's like 50 links, but you don't have to drill down to find what you need. If you're looking for the science section, you look and you find the science section. You don't have to divine is science under, you know, tech or is science under, you know, something else or, uh, so I think, I think the experience of helping people find what they're looking for and serving that up outweighs uh, sort of beautiful design. But that said, if you, I don't, I don't think it has to be an either or. Um, and there's a lot of design trends now that I think are doing a really great job of uh, having that balance of great content and great design. The other thing that I would say on that note is a lot of times, especially with content and storytelling, less is more. So uh, another thing about great writers is they will cut out half the words that they've written. Uh, it's harder for a truly magnificent writer to write something very short than to write something very long. It's hard for most of us to do that, actually. Uh, and so if you're having the struggle of too much content, too many things, I think there's, uh, it helps to step back and question what is important for people to actually see. Do we need... I don't know, like uh, this is, I, I guess, getting into sort of too esoteric of an example, but on your blog, you have like tons of content. Do you need the excerpts or do you just need the headlines or do you even just need the pictures with the headlines on top of them? Or you, do you just need the one main story? Uh, I think the newrepublic.com has an amazing site they, they relaunched recently. You go to the homepage and it's just today's big story. And that's kind of a crazy uh, departure from the paradigm of, uh, of most content websites so I, I think the less is more, if that ends up helping the user experience, that's incredibly important. You can have amazing design that way. So I don't know if that's a, that really answers your question, but that's how we think of it. Kind of. So do you think if you have all this amazing content, should you show the user right up front, or should you kind of put it under the hood and let them explore and find it themselves, or maybe hint that it's under there? So I think the answer to that actually is the way most people arrive to content today is not through the homepage. You look at even sites like BuzzFeed, 90% um, of the traffic comes through the back door, which is social media. And that's true of our, our site as well. So we have tons of content. We're, we're publishing you know, several stories a day on our online magazine. We do eBooks. We do, we do all sorts of stuff all the time. A lot of it ends up on the front page of the, uh, of, at contently.com slash strategist, which is uh, our online magazine. But most people don't go to that page. Most people find the individual stories because their friends are sharing and that's a new thing that's happened in the last few years. Uh, it used to be people went to their favorite sites to see what's up. Now they go to Facebook to see what's up, and that leads them, or Twitter, or LinkedIn, which is increasingly a big source of traffic for us, for the business crowd. And so I don't think there's a danger necessarily in uh, burying your content as long as you're promoting that same content. Um, I think you know focusing the best stuff and the most trending stuff to the person who happens on your front page is important, uh, and refreshing that front page is important. But more important than that is how are you getting the individual pieces of content out there to a wide audience? I want to go back to you just mentioned BuzzFeed. You guys at Contently have some pretty big partnerships over the past few years with BuzzFeed, Forbes, Mashable, The Atlantic, just to name a few. When you guys are approaching these new relationships with such big Partners, what's the first thing that you tell yourself before you walk into that meeting? 
Uh, hmm, good question. Uh, the first thing, I mean, I think the most important thing is to actually believe that you're going to provide value for them. Because if you're not, you're going to waste a lot of time. And especially people who have less time than you or who are bigger than you, uh, it sucks to be the person wasting their time. Um, so I think that's the most important thing. And I guess in terms of psyching yourself up for big meetings where you feel like the underdog, uh, it really comes down to, to confidence. And sometimes, you know, you need to, to do whatever, you know, pound your chest in the mirror or whatever to, to psych yourself up. Uh, but usually, usually for me, it's either about uh, establishing the relationship of how can I be generous to this person uh, or how can our business help them achieve their goals. And if you can frame the conversation in that way or go into it from that perspective, then that's much easier than if you're going and asking for a favor. And sometimes these big companies do, you know, they'll give favors to startup companies, but those don't last long and they, they don't last forever. Um, so I think... I mean, I think confidence actually is the big uh, differentiating factor for entrepreneurs who end up closing deals, who end up punching above their weight, who end up raising money. The more you believe in your solution and the more you believe that you're providing value for other people, uh, the more you'll be able to sort of jump over that gap of credibility because you're new and unknown and unproven. Okay, so... Let's look ahead for a second, Shane, and let's say that we have a crystal ball in front of us, and it's it, it works, okay? <laughs> and um, nice. you, we're looking at contently. What what do you need to be seeing inside of this crystal ball to feel successful about where contently is heading in the future? Wow, this is a good question. You guys have good questions. <laughs> what do we need to see in the crystal ball in the future to know that we've been successful? I think the most important to me is uh, how many people are getting work uh, because of this. Uh, I think there's a couple of important things, but that's the most important to me. How many people are we able to provide jobs internally and contently? Right now, we just you know we've just crossed uh, 20 people, which is a great feeling. Um, it's wonderful to work with people that you choose and to provide provide jobs, especially in this economy. But I think how many freelance journalists are we empowering to do the work that they love? and not to have to resort to some job that they don't uh, because of what we've set up. And so when I look in the crystal ball, if we've arrived at the point where every freelance storyteller in the world has gotten value out of Contently to help them survive doing the thing they love, that to me is success. Uh, the other half of that, and this is what, uh, what Joe, uh, my partner, is most excited about, is the democratization of anyone can be a publisher and this idea that stories are more effective than advertisements. So I think if we look in the crystal ball in five years in the future, people are and brands are opting to tell great stories that people are interested in rather than shove interstitial banner ads in people's faces, then we've won. And because uh, that provides a better experience for all of us who are online trying to learn, trying to be entertained, and it provides more value for the brand if those people are more engaged. So those are the two things. And I think personally... I actually had this uh, a little bit of a crisis lately where I realized as, as a founder of a company, you start out doing one thing, and then you're doing 50 things, and then as the company grows, you kind of have to fill the holes that haven't been filled yet as your staff grows. So I've learned to do a million things that I'm not good at, and I've learned to be not good at these million things, but okay. Uh, and so I feel like at a certain point, so say Contently went away tomorrow, I am completely unqualified for any job, and I shouldn't say this like on something that's going to be broadcast. Uh, I feel very unqualified to have deep expertise as, say, like a marketer or as a hiring manager or even, you know, we had to figure out how to de-echo the office and the, uh, things that, you, you know, you, you don't think that you'll have to deal with as a founder. And I'm kind of terrible at all of those, but we've made it work. So I think that says something. Uh, but for me, at the end of the day, I guess, personally, what success looks like is, can I look back and say that? I have learned and I've grown throughout this entire experience. And whether that means I'm more qualified to do a particular job, I don't think is as relevant as uh, have I not regretted going to work every day and working on this thing. I think at the point that I do not look forward to going to work, that's the point when my company doesn't deserve to have me there. And I, I should, you know, I don't deserve that either. And I think that's a good barometer of and fortunately, so far, so good. Everyone seems to be excited to show up to work every day and uh, to work on this together. Um, but that, that, to me, is sort of the barometer of success. 
So I want to talk about a couple of other things that you've mentioned you want to do for considering yourself to be ultimately successful. I stumbled upon your personal website with a very interesting to-do list. Among some of the things you've accomplished are being on Gossip Girl, major props mm-hmm. for that, eating at 50 pizza joints in New York, and touring in a band. So next on the list, you only have three things left. Write a book, go to space, and set all the zoo animals free. All right. So, uh, go ahead. Oh, it's quite, it's quite the bucket list. It's a little bit silly, but uh, mm-hmm. sorry, you were, you were saying. No, I'm not doubting the last one, but... With so many goals in mind, and with your own startup, how do you keep that in track? Do you have any rituals that you think every day, all right, I have to read through a list of goals, or you talk, you talk to your friends about your goals? How do you keep that in line? Yeah, uh, great question again. I, a, a few years ago, I had this sort of early life crisis where what I had studied in undergrad wasn't really what I was necessarily interested in. I really wanted to be a writer, but I wasn't sure if I could do that. Uh, I ended up moving to Hawaii to sort of learn to surf and get away from everything and sort of think about my life and what I wanted to do and what I believe in. And uh, when I was there, I decided on three things that I really cared about doing. One was I wanted to build a media business that affected the future of journalism, which is what we're working on now. One was I really wanted to write books because that's my passion is writing. And one is I wanted to teach. So those were my three sort of North Stars, I guess. You can't have three North Stars, but those were the three sort of bundled in the star cluster. Uh, and, uh, and so that's been sort of my drive. And, and I'm not necessarily, I mean, those things can change. But at that point in my life, that's what I wanted to do. And that's still what I want to do. But then I also kind of have entrepreneurial ADD. And I, I tend to email people who are doing interesting things just for the fun of it. And, uh, and so, and I love meeting people. And so I've ended up having a lot of sort of side opportunities, especially before Contently when I had time for it, when I was a freelancer, to do things like, so on the list, you know, interview Edward Norton, you know, a huge fan of, of that guy. I think he's amazing. He has great hair in person, I'll just tell you. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, all of those things have been sort of passions of my, side passions of mine that I like to do. I think it's important to have balance, whatever you're working on. That, you know, we start telling people, if people are still in the office, you know, around 6, 7 p.m., Dave especially, he'll say, go home, and sort of roam the office and like turn the lights off and, and tell people to go home. So we want, uh, balance is important. Having sort of a fun in your life uh, is good. A lot of my sort of spare time now is spent writing, which maybe is a little bit unbalanced because that's kind of what our business is about, but that's what I love and that's what I enjoy. And so, you know, plan to write books uh, during and after, you know, Contently is certainly uh, in the cards. I want to go to space just because that's uh, <laughs> awesome. Um, one day, uh, you know, maybe I'll meet Elon Musk somehow. Maybe I'll email him and he'll actually answer and I, I can go to space. Uh, the zoo animals, you know, I, I like animals. I don't know that actually setting them free on the streets is, a, is necessarily the, the best idea. But because I'm coming to the end of that list, I feel like I do need to add some more uh, things to the bucket list. But the moral of the story is I think having fun and having balance and having this sort of adventurous attitude is really important to me. Um, and I think that ethos is part of what we're building at Contently too. Awesome. I love that. If you ever need a partner for the zoo animals, got one All right, right here. Nice. <laughs> and I'm here for the Elon Musk space travel. <laughs> okay. We can oh, even hit up right. Branson. So. Um, so now that we know what you do to keep the ball rolling, what do you do when you get stuck? That's tough. Uh, I mean, I think exercise is the question the answer you hear from a lot of people who have stressful jobs and uh, and who are entrepreneurs uh read this profile of uh of the president recently that was in vanity fair i think and i was surprised that he works out like for 90 minutes a day or something crazy like that and i found that the more i have going on and the more stress i have in my life and the more stuck i am uh exercise is a fantastic release a friend of mine named charlie kim who's the founder of a company called next jump here in new york amazing, inspirational guy. He told me recently, he's been sort of a mentor, he said the best time to get ideas when you're stuck is right before and right after you go to sleep and you work out. Uh, those are the times when your mind is able to be clear. And so, you know, if you have something that's bothering you that's on your mind or you can't get past the block, go for a jog. And after three miles, it's amazing how much uh, sort of inspiration strikes. Uh, and same thing with sleep. 
There's also, there's a great book. I'm a, a big fan of uh, an author. He's sort of fallen from grace a little bit, uh, but he's a, an amazing guy named uh, Jonah Lehrer, uh, lives in Los Angeles. He wrote a book about creativity uh, called Imagine. And uh, one of the main points in that book is how getting yourself out of your sort of bubble and your current environment is uh, great for creativity. And that's why so many people have you hear about ideas strike for you know a business or for a solution while you're on a walk in the woods or while you're traveling. I think that's actually one of the reasons why travel can be important for uh, making ideas and uh, and getting unstuck is you put yourself out of your routine and all of a sudden things from your peripheral vision uh, sort of in the back of your mind start to interact with the things that you're you're subconsciously thinking about and that that helps you get through sort of the blocks. <laughs>